Uh, hello and welcome to Digital Tabletop Fest. My name is Ali and I'm here with Aurot Digital and Thomas and we are streaming Dark Future Blood Red States. Hello, I'm Thomas Rawlings and I am the CEO of Aurot Digital and a long time player of the Dark Future game back when it was only a cardboard pen and paper game right through to the worked on the digital version with the rest of our great team here. Uh, that we will be looking at today. The title of the stream that I was going for, uh, Dark Future, the Car Combat Road Wars of the End Times, bit of a mouthful. <laughs> but I think what I wanted to do really was, was obviously we want to talk about Dark Future, it's a game we made and we're very proud of, but I wanted to use that as an opportunity as well to talk about the kind of, this, this subgenre called Car Combat of, of, of films, books, games that this sits in nicely. Uh, and by that, I'm talking about things like, obviously, Mad Max, um, great series of films there, Car Wars, Gaslands, Death Race, and a bunch of films they did around that. There's a very famous fighting fantasy book, uh, Freeway Fighter, uh, Auto Duel, which was a part of the Car Wars um, universe, Games Workshop's first game in this sort of subgenre, um, Battle Cars, and then there's a couple of video games, I guess notable is things like Interstate 76. Uh, and all of those games have this idea of car combat, and it's like, well, what is car combat? Well, they're generally games, or well, they're generally media set in a world that has this dystopian, post-apocalyptic vibe to it. Basically, things are falling apart or have fallen apart, mm -hmm. and that in the remains or or, or the, the kind of where things are now, the highways and byways that normally are just a, a way of getting from A to B or going to, you know, going to have a picnic or, or going to see friends or family or going to work have suddenly become these war zones. They've become dangerous places. So, of course, all the cars on there, they're armoured. They've got spikes, they've got guns uh, and something is, there's a scarcity of it. And so all, all of these subgenres have that in common, but they all do their own twist on it, their own interesting take on it. Uh, and I think Dark Future is no exception to that. There's, I think, is a really interesting take on it. Later in this stream, we're going to be joined by a very special guest, Graham Davis. Graham is a legendary game designer. Uh, he's done a whole bunch of fascinating stuff, stuff that I played as a kid and loved. Uh, I think most notable, he has done uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, first and second edition, a whole bunch of modules um, connected to that. But key for here, and another game he's worked on that is close to my heart, is Dark Future, where Graham worked uh, on uh, a number of things connected to it, but key is the White Line Fever supplement uh, that if you buy the director's cut of Dark Line, uh, if you buy the director's, sorry, the developer's cut of Dark Future on Steam, you get a copy of the PDF of that. So yeah, he's coming on later. Why later? Well, because uh, yeah, well, we didn't know when we recorded the first half, did we, that he was going to be able to join us? No. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah um... so, yeah, there will be a costume change as well for those of you yeah. with beady eyes. <laughs> you will notice yeah. that outfits change. Um, but yeah, can't yeah, wait. Recorded at separate points. Um, so yeah, very exciting. Uh, and yeah, that's coming later. Yes. And, and I guess the first thing we can do really is is show the opening uh, narrative uh, trailer of Dark Future Blood Red States. Cool. There's always another enemy. In the 1950s, it was the Russians, us and them locked in a Cold War. But in 1961, it was against our own people. The rock and roll riots hit. Youth culture clashed with authorities over new music and the movement sweeping across the country that came with it. During the civil unrest of those times, many of rock and roll's upcoming stars were killed in violent protests during concerts. The 60s would bring isolation and stagnation. Nixon beat Kennedy for the White House and immediately set out his agenda. Ask not what's in it for you, ask what's in it for the US. We withdrew from the world stage. Vietnam descended into civil war. Russia intervened, but as the scale of the war grew, its popularity fell. The USSR saw peace movements and embraced social change. Back home in the US of A, business and industry grew unfettered. Corporations became more influential than government. Pollution increased rapidly, the climate began to change, and those fed off the profits of oil and industry denied anything was wrong. Pretty soon there were water shortages and famine, and not long after came corruption and rampant inequality. Out of poverty and tension, gang cults formed. 
becoming more daring and violent as authorities attempted to stop them, making broken cities and the vast Big Empty their home. In desperation, the Ender B Amendment to the U.S. Constitution opened the door to private policing by sanctioned operatives, which rapidly eclipsed official law enforcement agencies. This is the dog-eat-dog -dog world we live in today, where the gangs and the hired guns and the corporations that pay their bills clash in the scarred wastelands we call home. Welcome to the land of the free, North America. 2025. Yeah, so a lot of stuff was going on there. Um, do you want to help explain a little bit of what we saw? Sure, yeah. So, so Dark Future has this idea of a moment in history where things were slightly different. And that, you know, like a like the kind of chaos theory thing of the, you know, the butterfly flapping its wings creates a hurricane on the other side of the world. That slight change in the timeline from what the dark future universe to what we have now is very very different. Um, and that that key point is what they called the rock and roll riots. They had this idea that um, rock and roll as counterculture it starts appearing, and in in our world in our timeline, rock and roll becomes a big counterculture thing, and then it goes on to create the 60s. Uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. In mm. this, that doesn't happen. And so, like, for example, uh, John F. Kennedy doesn't become president. Um. Um, Nixon becomes president in, in earlier on. And that, that kind of creates a different narrative path that the US is on to the one that is, it is now. That's really and cool. Then, yeah, That's it's, really it's cool. a really interesting idea. It's written, you know, the, the books on this is written um, um, by a guy, uh, Jack Yeovil is the pen name, but he's a writer called um, uh, Kim Newman, who, uh, and he wrote a really interesting way of doing it. What I really like about what they've done with that is is lots of the stuff is recognizable but different. So, for example, John Lennon uh, is a politician in the Dark Future universe. And why is John Lennon a politician? Well, because he was asked one time in an interview, if you weren't doing the Beatles, what would you do? He said, well, I probably would have become a politician. Well, in this alternative world, because the Beatles were inspired by Elvis and Elvis doesn't happen in the same way, he ends um, up as a politician. So it's, it has all this historical resonance which I think is really interesting. That's really cool, I like that. Yeah, and, and in this they've got the scarcity stuff. So things are starting to fall apart. Now, a lot of the car combat stuff, uh, especially the Mad Max, which you know is the kind of big one that lots of people see, um, it had this driver in the 1973 oil crisis, which I'm for, most of the time often when we're doing stuff, I'm old enough to remember X, but this one, fortunately, I'm too young. I was actually <laughs> when the oil, 1973 oil crisis was happening. But basically, yeah, what happened is oil prices went up really quickly um, to do with various political things, which I, I won't get into now. Um, it's an interesting history worth Googling, um, but that, that created a big shock in a lot of people because suddenly there were queues to fill your car up. Uh, and, and then there was lots of other stuff going on. I think people felt it's all falling apart. And so that kicked off a bunch of artists and creatives responding to that and what and, and they created a bunch of these dystopian car based things in the dark future universe it's not the oil crisis that's there it's actually a series of interlocking crises around the u.s state starting to fall apart around um climate change interestingly so remember they made okay. this game in 88 uh climate change was known about then and they had that as a kind of part of their narrative structure which i think is very prescient yeah what they're doing but there's also this idea of magic starting to come back in the game, uh, which led some people to speculate that the Dark Future universe is the start of the Warhammer 40,000 universe. Oh. Um, you start to see this weird thing happening with the, the laws of causality breaking down. Um, but that is idle speculation. <laughs> and, um, we can't possibly comment on that. So, um, I think from this point, what would be interesting, as as I've talked a lot, would be to yeah, let, let's let's start into a game. Okay, cool. The loading screens we were very proud of. They're very old school eighties because obviously the game was in the eighties. They they're, had that echo. They're of, super of, cute. Of, yeah. I really like them. Yeah, and there's a bunch of stuff around the tech in this that was very conscious with the UI that it was reflecting a world where the technology developed slightly differently. So it was it was like there's a famous quote about you know. I think it is William Gibson, like the, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Um. And this was much the idea that some of the technology we use is way more advanced than we've got now, but some of it's way behind. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so yeah so here's your car you're looking down on your car yeah um, and you know uh you know you kind of you you you've, you've got your narrative stuff there if you select shop in the top thing you'll see that you've got your different uh at the moment we've not got enough stuff but you see you you kit out your car mm -hmm. different you can kind of each time you come back in the shop there's different stuff available like it changes each time and that was very conscious on our part to give it that sense of of you grab stuff when you can that's a world of scarcity like if you come in and they've got the thing you want buy it then because it might not be in the shop next time mm -hmm. uh, and if you've ever lived in a place where they've had that scarcity which i, I had uh, have then you know it's a very different way where we used to everything just being on the shops as, as we are so that really worked and obviously the fuel we've got the fuel thing in there and that's also a big deal is that if you run out of fuel you can't go anywhere and so yeah. keeping a good stock on fuel and obviously the fuel prices go up over the course of it so we have that kind of sense of the scarcity in this as well yeah. so that, that's kind of a key thing that that drives how you use your vehicles it's slightly different from a normal um role-playing game thing that it, it kind of the scarcity is kind of baked into what we're doing there and that that roguelike sense of uh, of how you engage with this is, is within this and within the narrative stuff yeah um, I, can't, I can't afford any fuel <laughs> You've got you've got enough fuel to do a couple of missions. Okay. So then go and earn some money uh, uh, for now. So if you select the missions tab, right, and then um, let's see what we've got. So the number of skulls underneath tells you how difficult it is. The quote is normally quite a good one for mm -hmm. just earning some cash. You just got to kill a bunch of people. The data heist fund, but they're a bit more. Well, were there? Have you done a data heist one? Are I you... did. Yeah, I did. I try. I did a data heist one yesterday, and I I think I I accidentally like got rid of both of the truck like two of the trucks i destroyed them and then right. in the last like 20 seconds i managed to complete the level with like the third truck so oh, it was right. very stressful <laughs> left data heist just deleting the data then yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, do a quota. let's do a quota okay um so yeah when you select your mission it tells you because the, the the narrative framing of, of this is like law and order is broken down in most of the us and so essentially if you want some policing done, you want to pay for it. And so in this case here, somebody, the, 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 the state, the US government is paying you to go and get rid of a gang that's causing problems. Uh, and so you're basically like a bounty hunter going off to do that. Okay, cool. So shall I just launch yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Please don't judge me for my, how I play. <laughs> no, I, I will not. Well, what I want to, what I want to do first, um, once we come into this game, uh, what would be useful would be to pause it there. So what you're seeing now is uh, my copy of Dark Future Blood Red States, which is a bit of a state because it is 30 odd years old. Uh, and, I'm, and you can see that uh, these are the different stuff you've got when you get the game. You get the road sections, you get the cars, you get the rule books, you get uh, a bunch of um, counters and markers to show range of weapons, explosion tiles, that that sort of stuff so it gives you a sense of it it's a very very car uh sorry it's a very classic kind of board game thing the thing i liked on this and and i'll just show this now is they they had on this one it said 3d role-playing game so weirdly enough we see it as a kind of tactical board game but at the time games workshop saw it as a three-dimensional role-playing game i.e you had a character that character had a role in this dystopian world and you played that and, and i like that a lot because i guess they thought the idea was a very innovative that 3d role-playing games will become a thing and of course now they very much are a thing but not in the kind of dark future cardboard sense yes or video gamey sense <laughs> so so that that's what the original game that that we obviously uh, used as our basis for that looks like and we'll jump back into the real game now cool resume cool okay so uh, what would be good to show first people because what, what i want to again the frame of this is so how like some of the key loops in the game movement and combat work mm -hmm. and then how they work in uh the the physical game you can see our, our thinking on this so as you're moving forward here you can see you've got a vehicle in front of you and if you hit the space button this shows one of the first innovations we did in it so what what people can see now is that time has slowed right down mm -hmm. and that was a really crucial thing that obviously the board game is a turn-based game and we'll sh i'll show that a little bit more as we go into it and we wanted that sense of a game that was turn-based, but in a way, when you've got this really powerful machine in your computer and it can simulate all of this amazing physics stuff, it seems like you're losing a bit to make it all turn-based. Like the board game itself is an attempt to simulate the physics of movement, 
of momentum of combat at high pace. And so, you know, early on in the design process, we went through a bunch of loops. It seemed like we were missing out to do that. So, yeah, if we run through some of the cool stuff that we can do in movement here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, shifting lanes is, is, is an obvious one that you need to do in both the physical game and the digital game. Um, you can see in, in, in our version of the game, all you've got to do is you go into that command mode, you select where you want to go, uh, and then you come out of command mode and it will execute those orders. And yeah. you can execute them in command mode. So this car is shooting at you now. So if you go, if you hit your brakes, so your brake button on there, and then yeah, come out of there, you'll see that that car then loses its tra its uh, tracking of you there because you jump behind it and it's gone ahead of you. But again, if you select that now, you select that car now, and then you use your boost, um, which is your like nitrous oxide boost. You could shoot past that car in terms of your movement uh, and get out of kind of danger zones with it. And that makes it when when the car's trying to track you, this little marker, that yellow marker now, is telling you that that enemy car is trying to target you, and that gives you time to do maneuvers to get out of being hit. Um. In the moment that it's kind of hammering you, that's because I'm chatting away and wanting to show the maneuver stuff. But that gives you a whole bunch of stuff that you can do: shifting lanes, um, you can, you know, braking and everything like that. And that, that gives you a range of tactics you can do in response to being attacked. So if we pause this. So what, what I can do now is talk to how this will work in the physical game. Cool. So what you can see I've got here is um, the cars. You can see that the, the track that you put the cars on is in the rectangles. Mm -hmm. that, that base on the lanes and the tracks, that was something we kept from the physical game. Like in early iterations, we had these discussions about making it more freewheeling where you could drive anywhere. And it's like, well, at that point, it's more rally. It's like, why is it a car combat game? Why? The, the, about you know it's about road warriors highway warriors freeway warriors all that the road was a central narrative structure and you know we we we, we went backwards and forwards on that but in the end decided do you know what the road is the focus of the game the road is the focus of the board game the road is the focus of the digital game mm. we felt that was quite important so we kept that um how uh, and again as i mentioned earlier like the board game is an attempt to simulate the difficult physics stuff if you're just moving car units like left right up down and there's no sense of the speed or momentum well it's not really a car game then it's like chess but they <laughs> look like cars it's like there's not so so obviously in the board game you know the designers of the board game richard halliwell and the other people who worked on it they wanted to give that sense of the emotion in the game and i, I thought they came up with quite a good system so what happens is the game is in turns and and we talked about that hybrid turn with ours um each turn has six phases uh, and what I'm showing you now is cars laid out uh, in front of each other. What happens is each phase you get to move and act if you're going fast enough to be acting in that phase. So, the, and the speed dictates which phase you move. So phase one, any car moving 20 miles an hour or more will get to move. So let's say these two vehicles you can see here, one's moving at 20 miles an hour, one's moving at 40. So in phase one, they both move forward one rectangle. Okay. Then we go to phase two. Uh, which only cars moving at 40 miles an hour or faster can act. Only this car here is moving fast enough, so it gets to move forward, further forwards, catching up the other one, but the other car doesn't get to act now. And okay. so, and of course, as you move through different phases and as you're going different speeds, that gives you more action. So ultimately, you get to do more the faster you're going. There are some downsides to it, so there's a kind of playoff, but that gives you broadly how they simulated that. Okay, what, um, kind, of, what so kind of downsides are there? So the, the, the faster you're going, the harder it is to do some maneuvers, okay. uh, some movements and things like that. And, and the more likely you are to kind of total yourself in the process of doing that. Um, so and, and again, similarly with, you know, with what we've got, if you're trying to take a corner out, even though the AI controls the vehicle, if you're trying to do stuff that's too much, you can overturn your car in what you're doing. So again, we kept that. I mean, I said kept that. That's 
the physics of really driving cars dictates that if you do stuff at a high speed, things will happen. Mm -hmm. So, kind of, but I, I think if we go back into the video game now, mm -hmm. um, and let's let's start. Uh, what, what you'll see in that is that we chose the the kind of tactics of that movement. So, within that original thing. So, if you if you select your vehicle now, if you go to accelerate in the acceleration thing below, mm -hmm. uh, on say one sixty, take your speed up there. You'll see the acceleration. Uh, you'll just kind of zoom ahead of this car now because you'll go much faster than it. You kind of move on and get out of range of it. And then there you're kind of long gone now. So so there, you know, that allows us to look at the manoeuvring is a way of... Uh, the, the tactics, so as we're approaching this other car, we'll see some of this stuff in the tactics of how the manoeuvring works. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go behind in the lane behind him, how are you in front of him now? If you go... Yeah, if you go into the lane in front of him, that's yeah. it, and pause it now. Now select your um, uh, boost action. Yeah. What he'll do is he will ram that car there. Once you go back into port, and then you smash um, into that mm. car, cause damage. Now, if you pause again, and then now you hit with your machine gun, your light MG, then you're basically sort of zapping in, and your cutting beam as well. Let's use the both. You can see then that you're sort of hammering into that car there with you're using the manoeuvring of the positioning you are in order to be part of the combat with that car. And I think that's a key thing that we focused on the tactics and the movement, not the mechanics. Mm -hmm. the, the, we want the computer to handle all those mechanics of the, physical sim uh, the physics simulation. And we wanted the player to focus on the tactics and strategies of what they do. Um, and so, yeah, I think what would be nice that is now is to show a little bit more of the combat. Okay. So, um, I know you've been playing it a little bit before, and I don't know how much of a chance you got to play around with the combat stuff. Um, I played a little bit of the combat. Um, I don't think I'm very good at it, but I played well, a bit of it. <laughs> I'll show you, yeah, no, you, you definitely seem to be getting the hang of it. I'll show you a tactic you use a lot. So, if you accelerate past them now, um, yeah, you boost past that one, go into the lane. That, so, that one's coming in behind you now. Mm -hmm. So, if you pause and turn around and see where he is. Mm -hmm. If you drop pipe bombs on that now, and also grab your, click on the targeting cutting beam, but the, yeah, the, the target current lock. Lock on the one in front of you, because that's going to get in your way. Then activate that action, and then now go back in. You'll see now that we're able to drop some bombs behind to deter those, and take the one out in front of you, which hopefully the, the, that might damage the ones behind as well. So they're coming up behind you now. So if you switch across two lanes onto the other side. To there? Yeah. And okay. then do your action to move forward on that. And then as you go into the other two lanes, go back into command mode and hit brakes. So they'll shoot past you now, or, or right there. And it messed up their targeting a bit, not enough. Mm -hmm. But your pipe bombs are ready now. So if you jump back two lanes and then pipe bomb them, and then I'd also use your cutting lasers to hit them with that. You'll see there. And you, that one in front now, you go into fan mode now, he's in front. You can machine gun him. Oh, he's moved, yeah. So what's nice, when you do a spread of machine gun fire and you move lanes, you get to spray a wider area. Mm. I it's slightly less folks. Now you'll see in your car, you need to do your repair action. Oh yeah. So, you, you've kind of taken you, you've taken a lot of damage to your front area, um, mm. which is yeah. Which which once the shields are down, that makes you vulnerable. And that's another area of the board game that we kept is we kept the so the the kind of the, the armor system, the kind of core of the car, that sort of stuff. It's a little bit different in the board game, but but the principle of of that cars have armor and that armor is really important to stop you taking damage to your core. Mm -hmm. That that kind of within both the systems ish I say I'm sort of simplifying it down a little bit in, in yeah. how it works. So let's do a bit more combat coming up to these ones. So an action I like doing a lot is a boost right into them and then as you're boosting in you shoot and use your cutting beam on your top to okay. kind of like cause maximum damage on the car. And then as you shoot if you end up shooting past them then you pipe bomb them as you go past. Nice. Okay, let's get straight past them. Oh, it's very yeah, tense. Yeah, you're going to be able to. Yeah, he's behind you now. That one is. 
Is that gonna work? Uh, possibly depends what. Oh. Oh yeah, you know you hit him with him a bit. Right, he's right in front of you, so yeah, hit him with everything. <laughs> nice. Now pipe bomb them. Do you see how that? Perfect. Nice. That was a good shot. See <laughs> flipping around there with his lasers going off into the sky. <laughs> um, see, so in this in this quota mission, you just got to destroy a bunch of vehicles. We use this kind of roguelike structure in the narrative thing. So there's a series of stories in Dark Future where you play different characters. So at the moment, you tend to be taking out what they call the gang cults. Um, but in other versions of that, you. Yeah, that one's targeted at you, so you might want to flip lanes and get past them. Yeah, so you've messed up his targeting, which is great. Um, that's got some quite big front weapons, so mm. you might want to drop back. Yeah. Yeah, nice one. See, he's messed up the targeting that they were trying to do on you. There we go. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Another card for I think you only need one more. Okay. So you put a little cooldown on the weapons there, so as, as you use them, the cooldown comes in. Obviously that's something we put in this game and not in the original. Yeah. That gives a sense of ammo and things like that. Again, we had this discussion early on, do we want to put ammo in? Uh, and that's like, I didn't think that would be a lot of fun to manage the ammo. It was the same with the movement of the cars. Like an, an earlier iteration, you did all of the movement, mm -hmm. almost like turn-based, moment to moment. and. It just wasn't a lot of fun. It was like I spend all my time trying to avoid crashing into a like a, a bit of debris on the road. And I'm not spending my time doing the fun bits, which are the, the combat and maneuvering around. So we sort of reconstituted it to make sure that that's what we were doing. Oh, nice one. Cool. Yeah, it is. It is really fun when you get the hang of it. Um, it took me a while yeah, to get, get the hang of it. Bigger weapons like that. That's when it really. Like the, the rocket launchers are oh. some of my favourites. And when you want, yeah, there's, there's a really nice array of weapons in there. You wait for that to catch up. Yeah. Come on. There, there, you get, there they go. And then. And then. Oh, they're very low on health, so I don't think it's going to take a lot to take them out. I know you're being hit from behind, I think. You need to do some Oh, repairs. I need to do some repairs really bad. Yeah. Oh. Might want to do some maneuvering as well, so yeah, stop them from the you. You're very close to winning though. I it's am. Good. I would break. Very nervous about dying. <laughs> yeah, nice maneuvering. You, you totally got out of the way of that. That. Attack. Right. Come on. Nearly there, nearly there. Yay! Yay! Well done. <laughs> Excellent. Tense. <laughs> yes, very tense. So um, I think when we come back into the mission complete, uh, actually, me, yeah, I said before, like before we jump off this this screen, I said before that it's definitely not um, the the Warhammer Forty Thousand Universe was not is not canon that the Dark Future Universe is the start of it. Now I look at it, that icon at the top, really the top um, top left, really does look like. The Tazine Chai. <laughs> overlay the two next to each other and see uh, that that's entirely accidental and not at all. Just <laughs> drag in there around that, honestly. Okay, so what would be useful to show now is a little bit about how the combat worked in the physical game. Yes. Um, so within the physical game now, um, again, I'm sort of using my copy here. You can see that when you've got so we've got two vehicles, one in front of the other. And, and at this point, you know, the cars have different weapons. And again, similarly to the board game, um, we had the kind of, well, they call them passives, in, in which are the rear amount of weapons. Their weapons just kind of drop, like oil slicks and things like that. We have rear amount of weapons, and we have sort of more passive likes, but we did a slightly different range of them than just those. Um, but obviously, you saw the pipe bombs we were using there, uh, the spikes and other things like that that we've got in the digital game. And, and again, most of the weapons in the digital game are in the physical game as well. There was, uh, that's another area where we, we did map closer to what they did. Mm -hmm. So in the physical game here, uh, you get to take an action as part of your phase. Uh, so in, in, in this example here, I'm behind another vehicle. I would check my range. I would see what my range was. And so in this case, it's three rectangles in front. So that gives me a kind of uh, a, a base hit of three. 
uh, of what I need to hit. Then you get modifiers, and they can, there's a range of modifiers that can come into play on what it works, uh, like the weapon you're using and stuff like that. Um, and then you roll a dice. If you equal your target number, you've hit. If you've not, if you've got lower, then you've missed. Then you do a damage roll, and again, the damage roll also uses armor in this. But this is the bit I kind of want to show that I thought quite nice in the physical card game. Is what happens is as your car takes damage, the systems within the car, so your top speed starts to go down, your um, acceleration goes down, your handling gets gets harder. So it basically just gets harder and harder to do stuff on the car as it goes down, and that gives you a kind of sense of. Um, the car taking damage and do it. We we didn't map exactly with that. You know, we've got the armor as a separate stat from the um, vehicle itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of that goes into the kind of roguelike gameplay that we wanted to have. Um, but again, there, there are bits where we we've kind of kept it, and there's bits where we kept it different. Um, what I think you get if you play the physical game, and there's a bunch of videos you can you can find with people playing it, or you can get all the copies off eBay still. Uh, and there are more modern games that you can do on that, like Gaslands is, is very good fun, uh, and I'd recommend trying that. I think it's interesting to play a physical car-based game after playing Dark Future, because a lot of the stuff you see we did in that physics thing, it's, it's how they're trying to simulate that physics of real-world stuff, and I think it, you know, it's interesting the creative approaches they've taken to do it, and how that maps from what we did with this hybrid turn-based real-time which ultimately is something I'm super proud of what the team did on that mm -hmm. as a really interesting approach to having that board gamey strategic sense. So it's not just a driving game. And in fact, in our trailer to it, you know, we said this is not a driving game. when you see the footage of it it looks a bit like a driving game mm -hmm. uh, you know you, you think oh this is a driving game now um, but we wanted to make it really clear no th this is not a driving game even though it looks like it it's a tactical car combat game yeah. it's about the choices you make and not about uh, the direct control mm -hmm. and that, that to me was always the really interesting innovative stuff we did with the gameplay that that actually comes from the board game and it's very authentic to the board game yeah it definitely um, is a lot more combat heavy than it perhaps looks on the outside um mm. it does look like because any anyone sees a game with cars in and it's like oh it's a driving game but it's not because you don't really have to think about any of the driving apart from accelerating boosting and what lane you're in um yeah. and you just have to use it tact like tactically rather than to like get ahead or whatever um and i think it's really interesting and also i was wondering when you upgrade your car in the in the video game you have like a weight capacity for your cars do you have that similar thing in the board game um not 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 quite the same thing i mean the board game i think the 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 different i think we the narrative stuff that we did that weight capacity is a really useful way of driving the change in how you get the weapons getting fuel uh building the armor and everything in your car um i think that was like when you're designing a video game, that, that flow through of the narrative stuff is very different. Whereas when you're doing a board game, most board games, not not all of them, certainly not, but, but a lot of board games and certainly Dark Future, they, they are head-to-head -head games. So the idea is you and a friend play the game, you're against each other. So there's an immediate narrative framing that you're going up against your friend in playing this game. When you're in our game, because it's a single-player game, that's kind of gone. So that immediate like fun and tension of playing against another human being isn't there. I mean, again, and that was very conscious on our part that we wanted this narrative exploration to it. So we need a different series of dynamics to drive that story going forward. And the accumulation of cool stuff into your car is a big motivator. Everybody likes to get bigger weapons, everything like that. Yeah. But we need a way to guide the player through doing that. And building up your car to carry more weight, to carry better weapons, is a good way of balancing that journey so that it feels 
like you're making progress without just unlocking everything in one go or making it feel too grindy to get there that that was kind of our approach to that mm -hmm. okay cool that's that's cool i like i do like the there's like slight variations like to help them help it translate better into a video game mm. it's really really cool i actually really um, enjoy the game as well we're extremely pleased to welcome onto the stream uh, a very special guest uh graham davis one of the original developers of dark future but he's got a huge line of amazing works on his CV from Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, Medieval Total War, Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth. But here he is, uh, and I'm going to be grilling him about his work on Dark Future, working alongside Richard Halliwell uh, on uh, a number of things, including the White Line Fever um, supplement to the game. So welcome, Graham. Well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's fun to be here and talk about Dark Future. So, uh, yes, I worked on White Line Fever. Uh, I worked on actually everything in the line. Um, starting with the initial box set, uh, I was uh, had the role of editor and developer, which means uh, basically that... Now, when you design a, a board game yourself, you know exactly what you mean. You know exactly how the rules are supposed to work. But unfortunately, you can't ship a game with a game designer in every box to explain it. <laughs> so you need people in the developer sort of role um, to provide a, an extra pair of eyes, you know, coming at it cold, making sure that the rules are clear and they make sense and uh, they're, they're easy to, you know, there's, there's no room for misinterpretation and that sort of thing. Um, and also in the role of editor, just making sure that it reads smoothly and uh, is free of uh, grammatical errors and such. Uh, and that's largely what I did on in the box set, uh, White Line Fever, and then the uh, Dead Man's Curve, which was uh, initially planned as a, a second supplement, but ended up being serialized in White Dwarf. And uh, in addition to that, I also wrote little bits of filler text. Color text was what we called it in, in Games Workshop. Little snippets of fiction uh, to communicate the, uh, the setting, the flavor of the setting more. And uh, yeah, that was me on Dark Future. So on one of one of the things that I found, like from playing the game as a kid, and then when we came to do the video game version of it, and in, in mm. our video game, we kind of you know we we, we went into this in detail. What, what what we've done is in the board game, obviously it's turn based and you move it round. When we came to make the video game, I thought, okay, turn based is the kind of roots of it, and we're not making a driving game, so I didn't want it to right. be real time. But in the end, you've got this hugely powerful machine in the computer with this amazing physics engine. In, in our case, we're using Unreal. Uh, and it's mm. like, why aren't you using this to, to do all the physics? Why why end up with a complicated rule system of moving cars in order to mimic something of the physics when actually you, you can let the machine do that for you? So we ended up with this hybrid sort of system where it's real time and it's turn based. You slow time down, you give your cars orders, and then you speed time back up and they play it out. As a, as a designer on the physical game and playtesting that and adding stuff in, how did you find managing the, the, the kind of that balance between making the physics enough that their gameplay, but not so much that you kind of need a degree in maths to, to play the game? <laughs> yeah, well, um, honestly, you know, every, every board game, every tabletop game builds on what has come before. And... Um, so there was a lot of precedent at the time um steve jackson games car wars was very popular and um it was uh that in typical steve jackson fashion got very very crunchy as the the fan community got their hands on it and expanded it and tweaked it and um, we knew we wanted something a little more accessible but which was also powerful enough to expand uh, without, as you say, needing uh, requiring players to have a degree in physics. Um, and how Richard Hallowell started out with a, a grid-based system, which goes back to, I mean, even older games like Waddington's Formula One. Right. And um, so uh, we knew the sort of level we were pitching at and how, f how uh, long we wanted the games to be and how much work a turn needed to be. And um, we just sort of uh, cut our coat according to our cloth, as you might say. We, we had those requirements and we did the best we could within them. And then 
on just just you know digging into that a little more the in the narrative side of it which mm. always the narrative side i thought was one of the strongest uh, best bits about the game is that whole setting is really interesting uh, and a little bit unusual for a games workshop game to have so much kind of close to reality in a way but yeah when, when i would sort of pitch the game at people later on when we're saying we're making this game it's about societal breakdown there's a celebrity pre president climate change is ravaging the us and people go you know and then, then when you tell them yeah that that was kind of they wrote that you know, back in what was it you know the, the late uh, 80s you know yeah uh, i mean how does that feel to have written that stuff now do you feel yeah it has come to pass or you never thought it would get that far um that's a very good question but i'm going to take a little uh, little detour here <clears throat> because there's a story to be told about how the setting came to be written um back in 1986 or 7 um i think it was one of the first certainly a seminal cyberpunk book neuromancer by william gibson came out and everybody at the studio read it and loved it it was the new hot thing and cyberpunk as a term hadn't been even been coined yet they called it sf noir or dark sf or something and everybody got terribly excited about this and jervis johnson and mark gascoigne uh, they created this setting for a proposed role-playing game, which is why it's as wide and deep and broad as it is and has so many themes running through it. Um, but sadly, that was about the time when Games Workshop started uh, moving away from role-playing games. Um, the reason for that being that Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay and the first edition of Warhammer 40k came out about a month apart. Mm -hmm. and uh 40k shifted an awful lot of miniatures it was far more profitable you know per uh unit of manpower put into a, a supplement than any kind of role-playing game could be so the writing was on the wall there at games workshop but we had this setting and so with a, a few tweaks uh it was applied to the car combat game that uh, hal was doing and became the dark future setting and it, it ended up being deep enough to support a line of novels and uh, and so on um so yeah strangely the setting was never really intended for a, for the game it ended up with uh but it was just a, a sort of happy marriage that worked out um yeah that actually explains a lot because like in you know there's always i always find it fascinating the rule books you've got a lot about the the pzs the patrolled zones this idea of areas where people can live and they're quite nice and then um, yeah the no go it's all rough you know so it's it's like you've got mm. the contrast of that you know high living like you say sort of super you know yeah. uh, i guess 80s dallas-esque yeah know, sort of blade life. runner archaeologies yeah. and things and like then, that a lot of influences went yeah. into that and then it's very mad max wild west in other parts exactly so sort of, the yeah. game doesn't really explore the patrolled zones though because once you're outside all the no. games outside of them but yeah that that, that sort of explains it, actually that's really interesting um, yeah yeah, and the yeah. reason for, um, I guess, for the uh, the near future setting, it was I think it was set 10 years in the future at that time, mm. um, was uh, basically because it was a car combat game. And so, you know, without getting too science fiction about it, we, we knew we wanted to, the set would come with the two types of plastic car, but there was also a big push to um, to encourage and empower players to to do their own modeling projects, which is one reason why it was 15 mil scale instead of the 28 mil that Warhammer was and 40k. And um, because that scale would make everything compatible with the sort of cars you could buy in a toy shop. And uh, then they started selling accessories, you know, guns you could bolt on and uh, and uh, so that whole modeling side of the thing was very important to Games Workshop as well. And uh, that being the case, that sort of gave us a time frame of, you know, present and 10 years out, more or less, uh, to, uh, to, for the cars to sort of fit with the setting. Okay. No, again, that explains lots of the kind of decision making. It's really interesting. So another thing that I always thought was quite unique in the Dark Future setting, because there are a bunch of other, like you say, car combat settings, car wars, mm. 
you know. Yeah, uh, like um, Osprey's Gaslands came yeah, out Gaslands. just a couple of years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is a great game, actually, really, really good gameplay. Um, is, but Dark Future, as far as I'm aware, is the only car combat one that has this kind of chaos magic underpinning it, that the world right. is a bit supernatural. Yeah, and that, that was Games Workshop again. That was, um, they went... Uh, Initially, the game was going to be its own setting, you know, just uh, one and done. But um, there are always forces within Games Workshop's management to unify the IP. So, um, and this manifested itself primarily in the novels. Um, the uh, someone at Games Workshop wanted the uh, to build in the uh, the ruinous powers of chaos from 40k and from Warhammer to make it a, a, a Games Workshop game and uh, a Games Workshop setting. And at the time, you know, it made a lot of sense and it, it still does in terms of um, it gives a lot more possibilities. It was explored in the fiction line, mainly. Um, and had the game been expanded, then we could have done an awful lot of stuff with chaos cults, with maybe demon engines. Uh, you know, the mind reels when you start thinking about the possibilities. Yeah. And uh, in the end, uh, I think it was John Gillard, who's now the, the head of licensing at Games Workshop. Um, and he, he described it. He was a great uh, cheerleader for Dark Future in his sort of wilderness years. Uh, and always wanted to kind of expand the fiction line and he he summed it up as mad max in the matrix with demons and that was uh, that's pretty much the vision that's good because that that has given rise to for want of a better term the conspiracy theory that dark which i know is not canon but but you know we've mm. seen fans surface it that the dark future universe is the beginning of the warhammer universe i.e the idea that you know things start falling apart chaos starts appearing you know, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, was, was, I'm, I'm certain that was in several people's minds, particularly as the fiction line developed along those uh, those demonic lines. Um, and yeah. the, there was even a, a a line of thought at one point that the Warhammer fantasy world was actually a remote feral world within the Warhammer universe where all the different races just happened to have uh, had stranded populations thanks to the land warp gates and getting a little off topic here but yeah there was a, a, a move in the in the later 80s to create this sort of grand unification of games workshop properties yeah so just uh touching on that that final bit of, of that whole setting thing because there's a, there's a fascinating passage in one of um jack the overwhelm Kim newman's novels where he one of the characters is calling out or, 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 or reflecting on all these various deities that are kind of looking down or giving you know it's kind of slightly ambiguous but there's a huge list of deities some of which are you know real mythological you know deities right but then there's a bunch of lovecraftian ones in there that mm -hmm. I, I think you know there's a bunch of like Warhammer ones reference. I mean, was yeah. that Raftian stuff was that floating around the the, the studio as well? Um, only as an influence. Um, Kim, of course, as as you, we all know from Anno Dracula and others, is a, an inveterate name dropper, and he'll put anything from anywhere into everything he does. Um, but um, as far as uh, Games Workshop was concerned, and, and uh, they like to ring fenced their ips and not uh, you know keep keep everything nicely under control um and so the lovecraftian influences i would say would be no more than an influence any more than the the michael moorcock influence uh, on the powers of chaos you know it's it's there it's a sort of a seasoning rather than an actual reference or a borrowing well, yeah, that's a good good way to refer to it. Because the the other bit that I thought was was quite interesting, again, as how sort of life has caught up with it, was this. And we exchanged emails on this, this before. This idea that you know, in Dark Future, you've got if if people watching this have not played it, this, the sanctioned operative, which is the idea of like a private police force, because the, the the government has just abandoned control of large areas of the continental U.S. 
And if you want any kind of law enforcement, mm. you basically got to pay for it to become completely privatized, which again was this completely fictitious thing. And then I, I sent you that email of a, a church who'd uh, you know got the legal right to set up its own police force as distinct of security, i.e. they're not just right. citizens, they're citizens empowered with the right to arrest mm. and stuff like that, you know. And yeah, it's uh, I was uh, my jaw dropped when uh, when I saw that link when you sent it to me. And it's uh, it is really quite bizarre how uh, how certain things have uh, have become prophetic. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're almost living in a time beyond fiction at the moment. It's very, very strange. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, um, it's sort of quite a, yeah, it's sort of quite a strange thing. So did you think, you know, working on Dark Future, did you get a sense that you felt that would still, there would still be fans around? Because, you know, we picked up the project, yeah, just something that I played as a kid and really liked for mm-hmm. various reasons. I just, you know, it was a bit more of a, like a passion project. Uh, so doing that was really exciting, really good fun. And then, you know, through that connected to quite a few other fans who probably same sort of age as me, same sort of, you know, like ended up getting into it as a kid. Um, you know, did you feel that that had, yeah, that we would, you would be talking about Dark Future all these years later? Uh, not in the least, no, no. I mean, we had a sense that Warhammer and 40K had legs uh, and would continue, um, but honestly things like dark future and, and and even adeptus titanicus were just things we were trying we were going to throw out and uh, see what happened and um, uh, to some extent they were also uh, trialing the technology that we that games workshop was going to use for plastic miniatures you know they were simpler shapes um, less uh, less core to the IP uh, so just uh, a kind of a test bed to figure out how to make plastics work at that time, and I mean, um, the so kits, the car kits. Yeah, yeah, the car okay. kits and the, the Titan kits in Adeptus Titanicus, and um, so they were all a sort of an experiment with uh, very little in the way of expectation, and I mean you can see this where um, you know why. Dead Man's Curve, the second supplement, ended up not being released in the same format as, as White Line Fever was. And uh, the that point, the decision had been taken to kind of wind down Dark Future. And uh, so we had this material and it just got thrown in into White Dwarf. And that was it, I think, uh, in many people's minds for the game. Uh, it had run its course, it had got a... A nice little following, but uh, nothing like the the legions of fans that uh, Warhammer and 40k had garnered, and uh, it was time to move on. And then, through Kim Newman's work in the fiction line, that sort of started up, but it was always peripheral. It was never considered a core property. Mm. Um, so, yes, to to sort of finally come back and answer your question, I I absolutely amazed. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that it still has fans um it, and uh, the the passion you know of this i mean we were just a bunch of kids fresh out of college just messing around doing stuff that looked like fun uh and the fact um jervis johnson one day said of warhammer 40k in in 20 or 30 years time people are going to look at this the way that we look at thunderbirds today and we all thought he was absolutely nuts but you know, here we are. Uh, it's it's a really strange feeling for for someone you know who who helped make the stuff that uh, there's just such passion out there still for it. And then um, the final bit that would be kind of interesting to, to sort of know is, is dig a bit more into the gang cults because because again, like you say, yeah. I can see in in the initial book they're kind of they're they're there. They're not fully fleshed out in the later no. book. You know they do come there and again you know when, when i was sort of revisiting all my stuff and doing the research of it i thought you know i'd seen the the parallel of climate change i'd seen the parallel in terms of like you know the, the mm. you know gave the example of the sanctioned operative and then when i was doing the research i thought well, where's the other parallel and then i thought something like isis you know it's a gang cult like uh, something that is so yeah. extreme that it's simultaneously a gang and it's also like a cult it's like hard to 
separate and, and i thought you know again do, do, maybe dark futures are yet again been incredibly prescient in what it what it predicted well perhaps although we can't claim the prescience for our own because the the whole cultish nature of gangs it was a mix of a straight ripoff from mad max where the gang members are to all intents and purposes cultists they're they're bizarrely dressed faceless individuals who who swarm in hordes to certain death in the name of whatever it is they follow um and the sort of other dimension to it was uh 70s and 80s um music and fashion which were terribly tribal at the time you know you'd never get a headbanger and a new romantic to agree about anything and uh so you see some of the illustrations in uh i think it was white line fever you know there's a, a gang that adopt the part of the um the look of, of 80s hair metal bands and there's all that sort of stuff going on as well so um in in any sense that it is prophetic it's 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 pure luck because we were just borrowing from everything around us that's uh it's been an uh, absolute pleasure to have you join us for the stream uh, and thank you so much for your time we really appreciate you and uh, yeah again thank you for all the work you've done in, in creating something that's given myself and I know lots of other people uh, so much joy over the years. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been fun talking about it again after all these years. And as I say, I'm, I'm just blown away by the fact that people still remember it, much less love it. <laughs> <laughs>